But Tim Berisha runs a California shop where he builds race cars out of Porsches. But that isn't the whole story. But Tim's an engineer. He started off sweeping floors at a local race shop in Seattle, then worked his way up to being a Porsche factory race mechanic, traveling for years to places like Daytona and Le Mans. After a while, though, something changed. But Tim made a plan to quit. While working for Porsche during the day, he built his own shop at night. He walked away from a job some people would kill for, all because he wanted to be happy. Now, a decade and a half later, but Tim's BBI Autosport in Los Angeles is a bright light in the business. He's developed turbo 911 engines, making more than a thousand horsepower. And unlike most big number tuner builds, his work isn't known for coming apart. Most of all, the team he built has repeatedly won the annual Pikes Peak Hill Climb, a grueling sprint up a Colorado mountain and one of the toughest meat grinders in racing. His most recent Pikes Peak project is a 1400 horse mid-engine 911 built for Ken Block. The first year they took it to the mountain, this year, it blew up before the race. Needless to say, they're going back. There's an old maxim that says we learn the most about somebody when they fall down. In this podcast series, we examine what happens when things go wrong in the world of cars, what we learn when we fall down, how we use that knowledge to get better, and how getting back up helps make us who we are. I'm Sam Smith. I'm a journalist and a club racer, and I love stories. Welcome to Driven to Fail. I gotta say, I've, I've met an awful lot of people who run shops, stuff at all scales and all levels of the business, and I am just like deeply in love with your career arc, right? Because the no, nutshell version, it. oh sure, I mean the nutshell version is just so much fun, especially in the broad beats. So stop me if I get anything wrong here, because I just want to lay it out for a sec. Am I cool? Absolutely. Okay, so you grew up in Seattle. You're a kid. You see Bill Gates, like the Microsoft Bill Gates, drive by in his Porsche 959. This is the car mm -hmm. he famously kept in Port Impound for years, the thing that, you know, was illegal to import for a while. He and a couple other people helped kick off show and display specifically to get this car into the country legally. Like, as, as Porsches go, as 959s go, like, that's a landmark moment. So you see that thing, it ticks something in your brain, and something hits about cars, right? Yeah, and, you know, just just before that, that, I was probably seven or eight years old but around then, but before that, I've been obsessed with cars. That's what kicked off the Porsche thing, you know, and... Um, it, I, I mean, I still remember it sitting on a grass lawn and watching that car go by, then sprinting in to see if it matched the poster we had. <laughs> and it was, and my cousin and I went bananas. So, yeah, you've got that right. Uh, but that's that was the, the weird Porsche click, and all of a sudden I went from the Countach to the 959 to, you know, so everybody had the Countach poster, and so now that's where we were with that. Okay, so that car kicks off something in your head, and you end up on a path. When you're older, you end up at a club racing shop in Seattle's east side, Bellevue, uh, basically sweeping floors. And then there is a big dotted line between that and being a tech at PM&A, at Porsche Motorsport, you know, what, what Ondial eventually turned into. You work for them for years. You go to Le Mans. You do eight Daytona 24s, eight Sebrings. You're a factory tech at the greatest endurance races in the world, watching the best drivers and some of the fastest race cars on earth win, lose, come apart, fall in tears, you know, some form of the dream, right? Right, right. Okay, so you're at PM&A. That's in a nutshell, yeah. <laughs> but see, this is I'm getting somewhere with this, I promise. So you're at PM&A. You want something more? You land a small, stop, small shop space in Huntington Beach. You start buying lifts. You open your own place. You leave Porsche in 2008. And then from there, things get really, really interesting, right? But the, the core of all that is that that arc, that's, that's the social media arc. That's the movie trailer arc. And everything else that happens in between is what I find fascinating and everything that's happened since, right? And then this year, you know, the, the end, end result of this and one of the reasons that, you know, you, one of the reasons that your name was in the news this year um, is, is the tail end of a lot of work you've been doing at Pikes Peak, um, one of which was building a mid-engine 911 for Ken Block and Hootigan and this thing that's wild by Pikes Peak standards, wild by Hoonigan standards. And you take it to the mountain and it eats a valve and it's done before the race even starts. But the car itself is so nuts that this is what I love, that that fail doesn't even matter. People go nuts for it, and you guys are going back. Did I, did I miss anything here? No. No, that's, uh, that's spot on. Okay. That's the, uh, the highlight reel. Okay. So, right. So, the, the reason we wanted you here, and, and this is always the kicker, right? So, the highlight reel is never, ever as easy as it sounds. And 
you're unique. And a, a couple of mutual friends of ours told me that, and, and we've talked about that. You know, the idea that you like talking about that and you wanted to talk about that. And I guess, I guess the first question that comes out of all this is, why the hell do you do what you do? How'd you get into it on this level? Why do you leave you know, that, that, that high arc with, with Porsche? Why do you get out of doing club race stuff? Why, what, what was the thing that drove you to keep looking for something else? You know, I mean, that's, that's, that's the, the $50 question right there. I, I'm still actually chasing that answer, um, be, meaning that I don't know. There's something that I'm still searching for. You know, and I'm 42 now, and I'm still on this journey. Um, that I'm, I don't, I can't put my finger on what that drive is. I can't put my finger on why I can't leave um, good enough alone. I, I, and I don't know what that is. Maybe it's, um, I'm not sure, but there is a drive there, and it's, and it's, an, it's sometimes unhealthy. Uh, but the the push, the push to constantly better my yesterday myself that I was yesterday or our team or the people around me that that constant push is um is something that I'm I'm absolutely hungry for and I get wildly uncomfortable in scenarios of comfort um and I should probably see a therapist about that side of things but <laughs> we're um we're, we're getting there but you know with, with that I am passionate about Porsches I am passionate about anything automotive um I love it I think I, I got I was drawn to it at an early age. I love the, you know, and we're talking about failure here. I like the fact that you have a thousand components, fifteen hundred, two thousand, four thousand components on a mechanical system, and one small, um, like a bolt, not anything, can derail the entire operation, right? So, I like the detail of that. I like the symbiotic symbiotic relationship that each component has with the next and the overall operation of said mechanical system is uh defined on those relationships and they all prop each other up i i think that goes for the team here at bbi i think that goes through the people i surround myself with and um uh, I, I i really truly enjoy being a small part of something massive and let's say my contribution to that part whether it's small or big could potentially derail or add value or success to, you know, the mechanism that we're, we're talking about, whether it's BBI or it's my family or, or it's my friendship group or, or, or car. Um, so I think operating within that construct is, uh, it, it exposes weaknesses and you have to look at failures because if you're not pushing and we'll get back to that, if you're not pushing, um, hard, you're, you, I don't think you're, exce you're, you're accelerating. Um, it's like running on a treadmill as fast as you can just to stay in one position. In order to accelerate, you have to really, really almost be in a constant state of falling to move forward. Um, and that's what I found. And I found that uh, my growth, and I think everybody's growth, I think this might even be a cliche now, but the growth is found in, you know, uncomfort, in the uncomfortable areas. Um, and th that's that's where I thrive. I thrive in not being comfortable. I think personally, I, there's a there's a uh, something that I, I find a lot of satisfaction in in being outside of my comfort zone. And it's not that I get nervous outside of my comfort zone because I don't know what the outcome would be. I get nervous if I fully understand what the outcome would be, and I didn't try hard enough to get there. You know, or, or, you know, we didn't, we didn't try this extra little, wow, you know, if we do this, that could get us there. And if we didn't try that because it sounds a little bit crazy, then I get uncomfortable. Um, so I, I've, I've, I've been very fortunate in my, um, my career and my, my upbringing, uh, to, to be able to push, you know, I've broken a lot of bones. I used to race BMX bikes and, uh, you, you had to, can you clear that that tabletop or can you clear that gap or can you jump over the side of that branch and you know and no no that didn't work but you know if you, you, i don't you i think i've i've kind of grown up in that weird mindset one of the you know you, you mentioned the idea of not knowing 
not n knowing the goal versus not knowing the goal, right? And, and one of the really interesting things I've, I've found with people who make big leaps, people who make a big difference in whatever it is that they do, right? There was always a moment where they had to walk away from something else in order to do it. And sometimes that thing that you walk away from is is this, this thing that most people would, would you know, give their eye teeth for, right? There's this, this old story that um, you know, the, the iPod, could, or excuse me, the iPhone, could never have come out of any company that wasn't Apple under Steve Jobs because building the iPhone required giving up, cannibalizing the business they had that supported the company, right? They had to destroy the iPod in order to make the iPhone work. And, and your moment for that was walking away from you know, a titan in the business, and not just a titan in the business, but yeah. one of the oh, pitiful yeah. shops in the country and in the world that focuses on making those cars work better. But more important, that place is, you know, PM&A is, in a lot of ways, that would be a destination for thousands of people who would get there, be happy, work there forever, and then retire. You left. What, what, was, what caused you to, to walk away? And, and I don't mean that like it was a bad thing, but there had to have been a thought process, right, where you wake up one day and you get an itch and you're like, this isn't quite it. And then that itch gets stronger every day, right? Sam, yeah, that that was actually a, a very, very, very pivotal moment in in my career. Um, I had two things going for me there. Um, I was young at the time. I was in my late twenties, and I was ignorant, <laughs> and I still am. But that ignorance, to you know, and, and to have been able to be fortunate enough to be welcomed into PM&A and work for that company and then enjoy it at the, along the way. And then while I'm there, I'm daydreaming about working in this essentially <laughs> uh, kind of a storage unit that didn't even have a front door. We had a padlock on it that I was renting from a guy who had a Porsche repair shop next door, and it was his storage unit. I was daydreaming about that, and I, I thought that I'm, I'm here at, you know, at the highest level of North American Porsche workshop like you you said um and i want to go to a place where i don't have power run yet and I, you know so i think that i had to answer that and i had to go and you know it was hard along the way but that was well, that was a huge huge moment because I, I finally just said look i've always thought about yeah, ever since i was in my early 20s hey i would like to have my own workshop at some point and i'd like to have some creative freedoms that I can try things at and I can blow an engine up and I can build an exhaust system and go to a dyno and if it didn't work then hey we're going to cut it back up and we're going to try something else and we're going to learn along the way of why that didn't work um, so you know and to touch on that also I didn't come from an, a background of education I left high school um, essentially to street race my 67 Mustang and I <laughs> found that fun and I was making enough money at it and yeah. luckily my parents were supportive not of the street racing but they were very supportive of me chasing what I wanted as long as it was within some sort of level of health right uh, you know and the the dirt BMX for dirt jumping wasn't sustainable you know it just <laughs> break too much stuff you know and, right. and there, right. <laughs> there's always a bigger jump and always more risk so but I, I was a I thought that I'd, you know, hone my or focus into automotive, and I thought that, oh, you know what? Sorry, I'm going to segue back to that pivotal moment at PM&A. When I went to, one driving factor was that I found myself not able to drive cars, and I always wanted to be a race car driver. Yeah. And when I was at Porsche, that got, I saw the level of what people had to do to in order to get a seat, like at Daytona or yeah. at Sebring yeah. as a third driver. Um, and I always thought that that would be fun because I was quick enough in a club race car that I thought with training and devoting my life to it, I could probably one way or another uh, get behind the wheel and maybe find a sponsor and use my gift of gab to do that and and then go out and have fun. But um, I did get scared at Daytona. I saw, and I'm not going to name the driver, but a very, very close friend of mine still to this day. Um, throughout those years of watching the person who is probably one of the top GT drivers out there struggle to get a ride, yeah. who also had the gift of gab, has the gift of gab, who also can sell sponsorship, who also, but just that struggle. And you can see the pain every February at Daytona, it's hoping, hoping that they can continue on as not the third driver, but a primary, you know, and, um, and then, you know, the old, hey, how do you make a million dollars racing? Start, Start with, with two, a, yeah, right? right? So, so I, 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 I kind of was compiling all that. And then with my ignorance and then my this, blah, blah, and my young age, I, I was like, well, if I want to drive, maybe I do it at a club level. 
And if I want to have a career in motorsport, it's not going to be behind the wheel. I should probably work on these cars. So at, at Porsche Motorsport, I couldn't do both. I couldn't drive a club race car, and I couldn't, you know, be at a high level of racing both at once. So, like, well, I'll start a company, which we did, and ended up uh, that first year. I think it was two thousand six seven 2007 we were it was either 2006 or 7 that i was doing it on the side it was just like a side project of mine and i was still working at porsche um i had a client that i knew from porsche that i made friends with they wanted to run the 25 hours of thunder hill and so i said hey i'll prep your car for free you can get it out there and try to get your tire sponsor and yokohama came on board because i, I knew them through porsche um but i want to drive <laughs> and they said whoa the mechanic drive uh, yeah so Ended up driving with them. Uh, it was uh, Randy Popes, Greg Fordall, my old boss up at yeah, up in, in Washington Bellevue. State. That was yeah. yeah in Bellevue, and then um, Craig Stanton, another good driver down right. here, and then the O'Connells who owned the car. Uh, we ended up driving that twenty five hours of Thunder Hill and winning overall. <laughs> and I ended up being able to hold my own behind the wheel. Uh, we we nailed the pit stops. We did great, and that's that was the the big. I haven't talked about that much, but that was the big send off. That was like, all right, but Tim. You can do this. You can compete at, at a club level. You can prep a car. You can keep it together for 25 hours. And then what happened was Uwe Brettel was the boss at Porsche Motorsport at the time, and I was his first hire there. And so these guys were going to – they used the 25 hours of Thunder Hill to practice for Daytona, and it was in a 996 Cup. And the 997s just came out at the time. So they didn't really have a fighting chance, but, you know, for a top three or whatever at the 24. But – they invited me to drive. They said, well, hey, you were fast enough. You're, you know, quite frankly, without saying, I was quicker than both the owners of the car. I wasn't as quick as Popes or anybody like that. But uh, every time I thought I'd be quick, Randy would just throw his time down or Greg would or somebody, you know, just like, okay, um, I'll just be back here cleaning wheels. Right. Um, yeah. So then my boss at the time at Porsche Motorsport, I, I came to him and hey, I got, I got this opportunity to drive at Daytona. I don't have to pay anything. They'll pay my way, everything. He just looked at me. He goes, well, here's when you're going to have to make a decision. Uh, you have a job to do. And he goes, I'm just going to leave it there. I'm like, because I was slated to work on the Daytona prototypes there yeah. um, for Porsche. So I ended up staying. I didn't I didn't take the, the chance to go drive with them. Uh, but that was my last Daytona with Porsche. And then what was so it, I ended up. Um, what was it like sitting ahead? on the wall knowing that you could have been in a car and you weren't? And like, how did that work in your head? That was that was miserable because they still came in ninth in class, which yeah. I thought was a tremendous finish. You know, it was the top ten in a in a nine nine six versus the nine nine sevens. You know, it's still an H pattern gearbox, and the nine nine sevens were sequential, and there was just a lot there. Um, it was it was really hard for me to sit there and watch it, uh, and it. But I I I look back, and it was kind of the, you know, the the nail in the coffin. I just said, okay, well. I'm watching this opportunity drive by, but I'm also in an opportunity. Right. I just have to pick. I have to pick which one I think would suit my my growth and my future. Um, I don't know if I was picking the right answers or not. But that's but obviously that's what's we're so here great about right it. now, aren't we? That's <laughs> so. so great about it, right? Because in that moment, you never know. And it's you know, it's it, it it's common to tuning. It's common to you know engineering. It's common to solving any problem anywhere. Half the time, if you're doing anything worth doing, you're trying to figure out the answer before you even really know what the question is, right? And you, in that moment, exactly. were there. And so, so what? Walk me through what happened after that. So, so you leave PMA. This yeah. is two thousand eight ish. It's late seven. Okay. Uh, we were in. Um, we were actually in. Uh, where were we? We were Salt Lake City. We had an issue with, a, without getting into too much detail, we had an issue with a championship that we we were we were chasing, and Ferrari was really strong. Mm. We had a, a scenario where we could have changed an engine package within the rules to give us um, what we needed in order to, you know, edge out and potentially secure a championship for the year. Um, but the when those ideas were presented, um, they were met with opposition because there was other politics in play that I had no idea about. And being a young, twenty-seven-year-old yeah. kid who knows everything already, um, <laughs> I got really upset, and I just said. You've got all these teams out here who are paying a lot of money to 
and upholding their ends of their deal with sponsors and drivers and sacrificing time with families and all that to, to come and race. And we can potentially get a, a constructor's championship and we, we're going to do away with that because, but it's that we could do this if we do, you know, push a little harder. Um, I didn't know what they were playing with, you know, balance of power. I didn't know what was, what strings were being pulled behind the scenes. So I, like a normal young person who doesn't, lost my mind and got upset and just said, all right, this will be my last race. Um, I left on good terms, but I just said, this is not what I signed up to do. I, I signed up to compete. And um, that exact moment of clarity there as yeah. a young man, which was not very clear, but it felt right. clear at the time, right? Um, is, is kind of why I still compete in these, these events. Um, Pike's Peak, run what you brung kind of, right? Yeah. Here's your rule book. I don't care if the engine's on the roof. I don't care. This is, you have to be safe and blah, blah, blah. You look at, um, you know, you go down to Baja, it's kind of the same scenario, right. you know? It, and then, then my next bucket list deal is to compete at Bonneville. And it's, <laughs> these are these three, I think, wildly iconic motorsport events in the Americas that uh, a, a privateer like myself with a little bit of horsepower behind us can go compete with, with, with the big guys, you know, and we can bring our partners along and, and, um, and still express uh, the wild west style of engineering. Um, probably, okay, let's do a bigger turbo. We don't have restrictors. Cool. Oh, we have a exhaust gas temperature issue. Okay. Well, let's run methanol instead of ethanol. Great. You know, I like that sort of thing. And, some people say, hey, you're just picking low-hanging fruit instead of going to go compete at Le Mans That's and, it, and do the minute sa- – you know, but that yeah. – like I said, there's a customer for everybody. To me, this checks the boxes of my excitement. Right. I love it. Um, I do want to go to Le Mans and compete at some point, you know, later on in, in, my, in my next life. Um, <laughs> but it's – you know, I'm a long way from that, you know, mentally, um, uh, you know, financially, all of that. But um, – but no, to your I'm point, a good time. To, to your point, right? So Bonneville, Baja, and Pi and, and the mountain. They, these are, they are the one thing that most people don't really know about them. If you've never been, is that each of those is essentially a big club race, right? Like they are not right. pros show up at, pros show up at them, often with pro grade hardware. But they are they are really just you know they're, they're the same as you know an SCCA regional at Blackhawk. Like they are they are great titans of of the calendar, and yet. You get there, and they still feel like a bunch of people just kind of coming together with their buddies to do some things, and there's some other buddies down the street, and like stuff just sort of, it, it's structured and it's real and it's happening, but it doesn't feel the same as standing on on on, on the straight of Le Mans, right? Because it isn't, and it, there's something great about that, and and there is something that when it comes to problem solving, and if you like, and that's what's what struck me about your career and, and about the arc of BBI and what you've built and why is that it always seems rooted in finding problems to solve and not finding problems that you wanted to solve, not necessarily that other people saw as distinct problems. And that's, you know, the one thing I always find fascinating about the motorsport business is that it, you know, for so many people, it takes this passionate, deeply lovable thing. It's often hard to parse thing. You know, why do you like standing on the Mulsanne watching a 9-11 rip by at, you know, two in the morning? I, I can't put that into numbers or figures but it's it's real but it takes that and it turns it into numbers and for a lot of people that can be really hard to parse emotionally and then you know a lot of people end up having moments like you did where it's you know i want this other version of the thing and that it's not lesser or greater it's just different right yeah absolutely um to touch on those three events you're right i mean if you really break it down like that it does feel like a big high, or high like kind of a high stakes club race um you see all the hardware you see all all the the heavy hitters you see the factories um a lot of the times you'll see um more of an ex- it's more of like an exploratory uh challenge like where hey we have a like for for a factory we have a big problem we need to solve and we need to explore some sort of high level uh, or high stress environment and all three of those events will take place it also reminds me of like you know with the cool part about when i was working on porsche motorsport i got to look at like vasic pollock's old albums and and i got to <laughs> see some of that stuff up in the al- attics and uh, wait they still they still have all that al- stuff yeah well uh, alan springer um he, he would tell me these stories he'd show me these books um i got man 
I, I know I'm, I'm going to toot my own horn a little bit here, but I got to take a nap next to Roland, Roland Kuzmal at Lamont, <laughs> you know, in, in a pit. And that guy is a beast. And, you know, just the fact that I was able to rub elbows with Norbert Singer yeah. out there and, and just these, these people that I've read books about, I, you know, and like David Donahue, his father, Mark uh, Donahue, right. I, icon, right? And, yeah. and he drove for us for the last three years at Pikes Peak. Um, that's the 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 doors that that opened up to meeting my quote unquote heroes and titans of you know Porsche development the, the they were living in a time that I wish I could have been where development and wild big huge swinging for the fences type of moves uh were wide, wildly accepted right um now like i said minor tweaks little baby tweaks cuz things are so far along that um, they've paved the road for us. You know what I mean? These, these, ti- I call them the Titans, yeah. you know? And so, um, being exposed to that sh- also gave me some weird air of confidence that I could also do something like that at some level. You know, I could, I could put, I could do those big, bi- big base hit, not base hits, but big, uh, swings for the fences and, and essentially, um, see what happens. Yeah. And, and when, when uh, you, you look you look back, it's like, man, what, uh, was I crazy? Like, w- w- what was wrong? <laughs> I mean, the with answer me? was probably you know? yes, but it doesn't matter, right? Yes. I mean, well, people still, yeah, people will still think, say, oh yeah, but Tim's nuts. But um, it's, you know, it's it's brought us to uh, to kind of a point of where now we are actually kind of honing our focus a little bit, and those big swings we've learned so much from. We've yeah. to to this the name of this podcast, we failed tremendously along the way, but. You know, the, the definition of failure is, is very subjective to the person who's either A, watching, or B, experiencing it, correct? Right. I think, yeah. And I, I, I wish failure wasn't, um, didn't have such a negative connotation to it. I think our society is, has, has conditioned us to be scared of failure rather than being scared of not trying What's you know you um, mentioned you mentioned Donahue right and and Mark Donahue yeah. his dad and one of the crazy things about you know his, his book uh, his dad obviously if you're not familiar his dad was a winning yeah, IndyCar driver Trans Am driver sports car driver I mean essentially built the template for how you know along with Roger Penske how modern motorsport teams look at process and problem solving and thinking and you know it was held up as this kind of landmark engineer driver in the 60s and 70s before he died but his book he wrote a book called which I'm sure you've read but he wrote a book mm-hmm. called The Unfair Advantage that most people I know in this business have been through like 20 times because it's just this neat little rollicking read of, you know, and then we had a problem at 200 miles an hour and then we did this and this and that and the other. But it is, I never thought about it till now, but it is just a litany of ways they fell down. And it's just stories, you know, all, all of these moments where they're like, and then we changed this and we found three seconds. Or, and then we tried the new turbo pump and the Germans were like, yeah, it is the new turbo pump. It's a happy pump. Mm-hmm. And things suddenly got better after that moment. And that doesn't happen anymore. But... So, so let's go back to, let's go back to when you started the shop. So, those moments, those great big career leap moments that everybody's scared to take, and that you know people who end up making great strides end up taking. You know, there's always uh, one thing I've discovered is that there's always a moment after you take that leap where you stop and you think, "Holy shit, what did I do?" Because something goes really wrong, right? Uh, th- what was that? What was that first big moment where things came apart? Not came apart in a big way, but just one of those that came apart in such a way that you stopped and you thought, we're in this. We're doing this. It's a thing. Like, when was that? Um, where, okay. No more paycheck was one <laughs> um, from, from Porsche. Yeah. Uh, and then after 90 days, my health insurance lapsed, which... And when you're young, you don't care. But right. that was also one of those things. Okay, well, now what do we do? And then, um, yeah. And then the other one was not being able to afford an apartment. So I moved back into my um, my uh, Volkswagen at the time. And you I had living a out of your VR, car? Mark III VR6. <laughs> yeah, I did that for two months. And then I lived, uh, then I couch surfed and then blah, 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 blah. So um, those times were, were, were tough. And I also to touch back on that when i moved to california i was living also in said volkswagen <laughs> uh for a couple months and then my buddy dustin who still works at porsche motorsport he was like no you're not you you come sleep on my couch and then so i made his life hell for for two or three months until i get to get on get back on my feet and get an apartment after i got hired um uh those were the kind of the 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 moments that 
if I go through this and I'm still not crawling back trying to get my old job back, you know, I've got the tenacity and I've, I think I have the the wherewithal and the confidence within myself to, to see this through. And what I, what I didn't touch on earlier was I was kind of a fake it till you make it type of guy. I, I still think I am. <laughs> um, um, but I have confidence that, and way more back then, that I would outwork anybody next to me no matter what. And I thought that if I could continue that, that work ethic, um, that the rest could, should pretty much fall in line because if I have a good enough attitude, um, treat people with respect and outwork anybody around me, um, those opportunities will start coming my way. And, and they did, you know, and I just didn't care. And I sacrificed everything to do that. Um, I think that was also part of the, 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 the you know, the, the drive and what gave me the confidence because I believed that I wholeheartedly believe that I can outwork anyone, which I, I know I can't. I've worked around some tremendous people throughout the last 25 years. Um, but I, I had that belief that I would outwork anyone. And still to this day, I still kind of use that. My body doesn't keep up with my mind sometimes. And, <laughs> but I, I like to think that when push comes to shove and you, you, we have to solve problems and we have to dig deep, um, that myself and the culture that we've built here at BBI, all, everybody here in the shop will do the same thing, if not run circles around me. Um, and, and that's why we have such, a, I think, an amazing team here is because they all have that same drive and ambition and like-mindedness about motorsport and creating and failing and learning. And um, just now, it's just the learning process is a lot more expensive. But so, um, okay, so you, you mentioned failing in the shop, right? And, and the, yeah. the, you know, I've, I've worked in a handful of shops and I've been around, more important, been around a lot of people who are immensely talented, building, troubleshooting, diagnosing, fabbing, you know, whatever it is, they are immensely talented at the job they are tasked to do. But in the end, you know, you still, the, the big problem that anybody running a shop has is finding people who are not just good enough, but who are good enough and fit the culture that you've built. So if you're, if you're working in a business where, I mean, tuning and building, you know, you, you, you build four-figure horsepower 911s as almost routine, right? But, but getting there and then much less going racing, you know, th these, are, these are things that require stumbles along the way because... You know, the, the process of engineering anything is figuring out what's going to go wrong and trying to get ahead of it, and sometimes you don't. You know, much less working on streetcars, right, which you do that as well. But when you're, when you're talking to people, when you're interviewing people, when you're hiring people, when you're trying to figure out who fits that culture and who comes in the door and ends up being part of the shop, how do you, how do you suss that? How do you parse that? And when you're looking at somebody across the desk and you're like, oh, the resume works, but... Um, I don't know if you're willing to face plan in the right way or think about it right, right? <laughs> yeah, Sam, that's um, that's kind of a casino because <laughs> if somebody, you, you know, you can – somebody can present well and somebody, what I call, they can do a good lunch, yeah. right? Um, uh, it's not until – not until you see how somebody behaves in the face of adversity do you see what, what they can do, what they will do, and how they – carry and conduct themselves and typically i mean this is so simple but i i don't judge people on how good things how good they are when things are good you know and i and, and i in in a resume um instagram um the the essentially the 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 for the forefront of what we see as every individual around us is that highlight reel is that bumper sticker is that um is that that you know the cliff notes the 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 this is for dummies book you know this is like that's the that's the front that we put on in order to get something do something be somebody do you know what i mean and it's not until you get kicked in the teeth that and then like you touched on and the whole reason why this podcast is here is is what what do you do and how do you pick yourself up and how do you behave and conduct yourself when you are you just got run over by a bus or you um, everything that you thought was going to work and you've bet everything on it and it just didn't. Um, how do you, how do you, how do you pull your pants back up and get on, get on with it? Um, this is a long winded answer to your question is you don't know. You really, you, somebody does, you know, I, I rarely look at a, uh, I look at a resume for experience. That's very, you know, and 
uh, is their path of their career moving in a direction that we could shape a little bit here at BBI with some time, time and effort. The other part is um, my, my team here, uh, I, I do a three-step interview process. Uh, first, you don't, I, I have the, one of the managers of one, said um, department. We have four departments here. Uh, we'll then find the hire. They meet. Do you like them? Yes or no? Cool. Next one is with me. Um, I ask all the oddball questions, make them feel weird, and then uh, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then the what, like, like, be, like what color is your underwear? What tree would you be if you were a tree? Like, what do you ask? You, you know, I, I, <laughs> I, I have a level of humility where I mess with people quite a bit, um, and I want to see. I want to bring some sort of. I yeah. want to see what you know. What 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 you know? How they behave in those situations. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's sometimes it's inappropriate. Sometimes it's. Um, <laughs> You know, I'm an HR nightmare here. Uh, and speaking of, so the third person is HR is Amy, who's been with me for 14 years here. She uh, she then gets to meet with him, and then she's more like the pragmatic, you know. So then that's that's how you get hired here. Then we do a 90-day process. Um, if you're green, we'll send you through each department. Um, if you just want to work, hey, I, I just want to work on cars. I'm young. I'm passionate. Cool. All right. So you go with Jared for a month in the engine room. Then you're going to go with Steve in the fab shop. And then you're going to go with Jeremy on the chassis. And then, you know, and then and then Bobby on the rest of the stuff. So they then come back to me and say, hey, this, this person is showing a lot of, you know, promise in this area. But do not put them with me. You know, put them over really? here. And then we're like, okay, how's attitude? And then after the 90 days, then – then we say your employment is a full time or terminated, and then um, you know usually you, usually the I call it the wolf pack weeds them out quickly, <laughs> or embraces them. Yeah, you know, and more more times than not, uh, by the time they make it back to the shop floor, you know they're embraced. Uh, we can we could see a lot of things, but the hiring process here isn't easy. People like I think they get impatient with me because. <laughs> But I like to take my time with that. I don't like a lot of turnover. Yeah. I mean, Jared has been here for 15 years, Amy for 14, you know, um, a lot of five and 10 year guys and girls here. So um, I, I cherish I cherish my relationships with, with the team here. Uh, but that's not to say that we haven't had a tremendous amount of people in and out of here also, um, it's, it's an which is unfortunate. Yeah, but, but it's part of it, right? I mean, the, the old line is, you know, higher fat. What is it? Higher, higher fat. Higher slow, fire fast. Higher slow? Yeah. Right. Um, but it, but it, yeah. it, and that's, what, what you just said toes into the, you know, this other idea. I had a college professor once who, you know, used to, he was teaching history, so he used to spit out a lot of the lines about, you know, how people work and how people think. And one of the, one of the really great ones that he, he didn't make up, he stole it, but it was still great, was something like you can tell a lot about a person by how they deal with Christmas lights and traffic. And, you know, the idea that when you're put in a situation where whatever you're faced up against is, whatever you're facing is just... It is what it is, and you can nothing you will do will change the nature of the frustration that comes from that. So when you when you have people in that process, do they? Can you generally spot the arc? You mentioned that some people have you know surprised you. I mean, is it you generally know what's going to happen out of it, or do you have people who seem to be going one direction and then flip, and it's like, man, this this isn't working, but not in ways I thought, and it's because that big stress moment or something else happened, right? Yeah. Um... I still don't have it figured out, um, but n nor will I ever. Humans are the most dynamic thing on the, that I've ever – that I work with, you know, and I, I like to look at uh, – you know, I, I, I have an engineer's kind of mindset when it comes to solving problems, but I'm also also not a trained engineer. So I have – you know, I, I like people. I like listening. I like lear learning about people, and you can kind of couple – you can – segment groups of individuals on how they think through different processes, how they shake your hand, the eye contact they make. You can kind of see where they're going to go. And throughout the years, I've only been able to learn this through experience that you can kind but you don't want to like, you don't want to kind of prejudge somebody or have any, you know, preconceived notions that somebody's going to behave a certain way because of something that you saw in somebody else before. But I'll tell you what, once you address a problem that you you have a little bit of pressure or heat behind you that you need to solve in a finite amount of time because we're going somewhere, it, it exposes people pretty quickly. This industry does expose people quite quite quickly. Maybe we'll just keep it there. <laughs> I think, yeah. Well, okay, um, so so how, how long before 
Do, do you work people up to the big stress environments like racetracks yeah. and giant projects where you don't know the end, but you know, you don't know how you're going to get there, but you know an output or, you know, the blueprint needs to be X, right? I mean, you have to, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and that's how I, I've, well, that's how I'm here right now is, um, you know, working at Park Place Motors when I was up in Bellevue when I was, you know, 18, um, they wouldn't let me touch a car until I could clean the toilet better than anybody. <laughs> right. And which I, which I understand. And here, you know, the young guys and girls who come work here, the same thing, man. Well, if I can't trust you to do a task that you really don't want to do, what am I going to have you go right. put the lug nuts on a 993 Turbo S and, you know, I got to trust the, that you can do the garbage well, right, before you start. <laughs> right? Don't you think? Yeah, Is that yeah. a weird thought process? No. And it burns people out because it's wild. You know, the entry-level position here sucks. It really does. But <laughs> I go, I go and... I clean the toilet with them. I clean the bathroom with them personally because I want to show them how I like it done. Yeah. And and one of the rules here at BBI is that whatever I'm hiring you for, you have to be better than me at it. <laughs> so Which is technically order, everybody man. here technically everybody here is better at their job than I am. And that's where <laughs> I want to be because like Amy's better at running the books. Yeah. Uh Jared is better at building engines. Um uh, Bobby's better at setting up a chassis. Jeremy's better at overall vehicle thought through and you know and, and all that. And so it's Steve's a way better welder than I am. You know, I can do all of it. Just not, not as good as these people. Um, and so that, yeah, you have to be able to clean the toilet better than me. And if, and if you can get through that and you can get through my criticism on how you clean a toilet, um, and I'll be on the hands and knees with you. Uh, yeah. Then, Hey, let's, let's, let's put, let's go get you over to the tire machine. And, you know, and as weird as that sounds, you're going to mount a tire on a $3,000 carbon fiber wheel. That I don't think I can replace, but that so that is real, right? I mean, I uh, that's the that's the that's the steps yeah. that I think a lot of the Instagram and instant gratification right. and social media they 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 don't they don't show that and and it and it doesn't and what sucks is that it doesn't glorify which I think those steps which I think are wildly important for longevity in any in any career. I mean you. Unless you're underhanded a bunch of money or these opportunities and you can knock it out of the park, I've met people like that too. And, the, and my, my hat's off to them. Um, but if you, if you want – okay, any individual that is lucky enough to have 10 fingers and 10 toes in their health, right, and a head on their shoulders, which some people like, – look, you're born – sometimes you're born and you can't do things physically. Uh, if you can, you can do anything you want, anything. You just have to sacrifice and you have to dig down and you have to – whatever it is you want to do, if you want to be a banker, if you want to be a Wall Street, if you want to be real estate, if you want to be a race car driver, if you want to be any of these things, it all comes down to how much you're going to sacrifice and how much you're willing to eat shit along the way for 10 years minimum in order to get there. And guess what? You're going to get there if you just stay after it and you keep surrounding yourself with the right people. You be patient, but you got to wake up every morning – probably sore, probably hurting, probably broke, and understand that that's part of the process. If you don't want to do that, then go ahead and complain and, <laughs> I don't know, be be mad that Johnny Racer on Instagram has a yacht and you don't know how he got there. Oh, you no, know what he I mean? earned I don't every know. bit of it. He uh, earned every bit of it. It's fine. It's total. He built that yacht yeah, with so his hands. So that's the sad part about this, like you touched on in the very beginning of this podcast, is that what Instagram and social media doesn't highlight. It doesn't highlight the the hustle and the the um the hard work that goes into it because it's not it's not fun to look at. Which is funny though, because right because that's the you know the 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 word porn of that that whole culture is hustle culture. It's grind culture. It's the fact that like you know showing up every day, bro, grinding it out like. And yet most people that, you know, I, I hate the 10,000 hour theory, the Malcolm Gladwell idea, but most people just don't put in the work. You know, we see it with, you see it in motorsport, you see it in writing, you see it in, in you know, people who are learning how to act, literally any discipline. Like it is, it is ours and it is work and it is acknowledging, you know, we, we talk a lot, uh, I've spent most of my, most of my career in writing, right? And, and working with younger writers, the idea that you really have to focus in on what you do well and then throw that out the window and stop thinking about it and then focus on what you can't do and then obsess over it and obsess over how you can't do it well and what stands between you and doing it well and pulling apart the process and pulling apart the problems. 
and, and the fact that the methods of work, right, you know, the, the, the methods of work apply to cleaning a toilet in the same way that that same method of work that you put to cleaning a toilet is how you assemble a lap, is how you assemble a motor, is how you, you know, stay married. I mean, a thousand other things, and so much of it comes down to just showing up and trying over and over again. And social media, especially, you know, Instagram's a highlight reel, right? You know, it, it is just the peaks and, and it's so, so toxic because it convinces you that you're not doing enough, whatever it is. And that, you know, it's easier for everybody else. I mean, so, I, yeah, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I agree with you. Uh, Sam, how long have you been writing for? Oh, uh, professionally 20 years. Okay. Bingo. Anybody who, uh, f- what I would say is, is most of the people I speak to who are, you know, at, at, a, at a level that they've aspired to be at and they've worked hard at it and you ask them like and you know it's like that 10,000 hour thing and yeah. I, it is cliche but and it is you know what I, I throughout my journey I've had a lot of successful people tell me the same thing over and over again I was telling I was like yeah whatever I'm, I'm gonna do this my blah 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 uh, especially this one one of my friends his name's Andy um, he, he lives not too far from here uh, he started a cell phone case company out of his mom's garage maybe you guys have heard of it it's called Incipio um, and he, he, throughout the years, I've watched him grow his business and then sold it, but he's, he's 10 years older than I am. And it, throughout that time, he always said, but Tim, you have to sacrifice more. And I'm like, what am I, I just finally got an apartment. <laughs> you no, know, you have to work harder. You have to this. And I kind of told him like, you know, pound sand, man, because like, I think I'm doing it and I, and you're not. And he goes, you got to give it some time and you got to keep at it. And you have to wake up when you think that you you're like, oh, I'm, I might need a new career change because things aren't happening at a pace that I want it to. Well, I'm BBI's been alive for what 15 years now, uh, you know, and and I feel like now I'm finally just getting started. So if if I could time travel back to my 15 years ago self, I would somehow hypnotize myself to thinking that that is the right path. But like, how do you tell that to a younger generation that um, is is a product of their environment right now, currently, right? So. That I've actually taken that as a almost a passion of mine now lately is when I have a you know you said how do I hire somebody I would hire like this guy Bobby who works for me he, I call him our MVP he celebrated five years so far young young man came here when he was 19 reminded me exactly of as I was you know he talked over me during our interview process he thought like he knew everything because he came out of a vocational school uh you know, but he had this little E30 M3 that was just beat to shit, and um, he was putting a single turbo on it that he bought on eBay for a couple hundred bucks. And I was like, man, this, this I like him. <laughs> so I, I, I hired him immediately, and I just said, hey, my job's for sale, but you got to do the garbage. And now he's now he goes to Pikes Peak with me. He's my my he's like my MVP. <laughs> you know, he's great, good attitude, always smiling, cracking jokes with everybody. He's kind of like the cool kid in the back of the shop. Um, but. That's what, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for somebody who just doesn't care about how it looks from the outside and they just want to really drill down and bust their ass and do try to earn a dollar in something they're passionate about. Yeah. By the way, it's a very hard dollar to earn, but <laughs> it does come with time. <laughs> Hardest dollar I've ever had to earn. <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny, right? Like it ties into um – you know, I uh, again, writing is completely not building building race cars. It is it is much, much, much not the same game. You guys are doing something that is is deeply, deeply hard, um, uh, and and I, I mean that right. But but at the same time, like I, everybody I've ever known who has built anything creatively for a living or as a hobby who is any good at it, they stop at some point and they realize that they always hate what they build because they're always seeing what's flawed with it. And and you know. I, when you talk to younger people about it, and God, I sound like a million years old when I say the phrase younger people, but when you when you try and convey that idea, let's back up, not to younger people, but to anybody who's new to something, when you try and convey that idea to somebody, this idea that like you have to hate what you produce because that's the only way you're going to figure out how to make it better, and that you know th- there's always this moment, and you can see it. You know, some people click and they're like, oh. And then some people, it takes you know, thousands of hours. It takes years. It takes you know dozens and dozens of work cycles even to start to, to process it. But so let's let's go back a second. So you know you mentioned we were talking about Pike's Peak earlier. Um, you know, and this is this is it, it's such a strange, neat, weird little anomaly in motorsport, right? It's twelve miles, twelve miles, 
12 miles up, up a hill, 14,000 feet at the mm-hmm. finish, climb of more than, you know, nearly 5,000 feet. Even the starting line is more than 6,000 feet above sea level, right? And, mm-hmm. you know, stuff fails there in a different way than it does anywhere else. You know, you've run uh, everything from, you know, 900 horse on 11s to GT4 club sports, you know, everything from factory built near box stock race cars to things that did not exist in any way, shape, or form before you built them up that hill. Right. When when things, what do they all have in common when things go wrong there, right? What is it just the sheer abuse or is it something else? Man, that's a good, great, great question. I haven't found, so I've been lucky enough to have found success competing at Pikes Peak. Um, and I say lucky because... It, it, it's a, such a funky deal there that you have such a limited amount of time to practice um, and then obviously as you know during the race you cut a tire and you're out your whole entire yeah, can you imagine I, I saw somebody break an axle at the starting line <laughs> they worked all year long on a car uh, and this is perfectly acceptable because it could happen to anybody Yeah. you know but instead like at 24 hours we roll that thing into the garage knock the axle back out throw it in <laughs> change an engine change an upright we cut once at Daytona we took two Celine S7s and made one car out of it because both of them, one had a blown up gearbox, the other one got balled into a corner and made a car out of it, and then they continued on, and it got like third place. Uh, if you hiccup at Pike's Peak, you're out, and you're waiting, and you're suffering, and you're stewing in it for the next year. Um, so I found some success there. Uh, common failure. More a pattern or a process. During the race, than... during the race, it's, it's, it's up to the driver. Uh, hopefully, the car is where it is. Like, if you do your job right, now it's the driver's job, right? Um, to not beat up equipment, not blow the, uh, you know, blister the tires, um, you know, drive around issues. You really have to drive around issues. You could knock a sway bar out, take a, your front splitter out, break a wing. I mean, there's so many little things. So you have to drive around that and be and still maintain a level of competitive uh, pace while being safe. Um, or in our case, this last year, uh, we we missed it. On uh, on our on our engine slash tuning slash everything package, uh, and we ended up not making it to the race. And this was after four and a half months of late nights, saw a lot of sleepless nights. Um, this is the Ken Block getting car, to Pikes right? Peak. Yeah, this is the Ken Block car, the the pink the pink pig. Um, you know, get to Pikes Peak June second, put five days of testing on the car, start turning the boost up, everything's going great. Come back there the following week to run on a Sunday, regeared the transmission, we found some issues, and then turned the boost up even more the car was just an absolute animal i mean scary animal um uh and i was very lucky i got to drive the car quite a bit um, really oh, i didn't know at I didn't least know that. yeah th- th- about three full days at the track i drove and, and doing the dev work and and getting that thing prepped so ken can jump in it um i and i got i, I typically do that like every time we take a car out there i'll break it in i'll run it down I, I i like a balanced 911 you know for the for the mountain and i like a 911 that has tremendous amounts of front grip for the uh for the track so you can trail break and but up there i like a little more understeer so we get it set up pretty well um the we just we missed we missed a few things and we didn't have enough tools in our box to recover from it and i think we were all a little bit out of steam um under prepared you know um it was the first time that i've been nervous to take a car to pike's peak and not for the fact of that we couldn't be competitive. I was, I was nervous because I feel like now that the dust has settled, maybe we weren't as prepared as we needed to be, um, because the thrash of building that car from nothing in a short amount of time, during uh, a weird time in supply chain issues. You know what I mean? There, we 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 had we had some challenges along the way, but getting this car completed, and I think that's where that nervousness came from. Was the maybe deep down i felt that i should have been more prepared for this um and now when i look back now when i look back i can honestly say that 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 is a pretty big reason why i I felt funky about the whole thing so that 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 kind of knowing in your gut that something's amiss when you look back on moments when either you know something you've put together as a something you've you, the shop has put together or moments you've had as a driver or you know moments you've had just running a business when you know things when things don't end up right, how common is it to have that feeling in your gut that you can't define and you just know something's amiss, right? Did you, did, is that something that, that, that you see a lot or no? Yes, absolutely. And I, I learned this early on 
but I don't fall. A lot of times I don't, it's, it's hindsight's twenty twenty, and I'm like, oh, man, I felt something, you know, and I ignored it because of the, let's say the passion or the energy or the, whatever the scenario is. When I used to r- ride BMX bikes, I remember getting a feeling every now and again, and it wasn't until I broke like my collarbone the third or fourth time, I was like, I need to start listening to whatever that is, and it's a very faint because you remember what I said earlier, brute force and ignorance. That's yeah, how I approach right, things. Right. But there's a very, very faint, like, behind that, there's a faint, like, hey, dummy, uh, <laughs> you, know, you need to, like, slow it down just a little bit, and then your ego gets in the way. Oh, I'm, I'm going to muscle through this. Um, it, yeah, when, when, it's, when, the, when the dust settles and you're reflecting, like, that is one common thing. is that little butterfly slash voice in your head that says, Meh, you know, and then... But then, you, you, then you're too far down. You know, like I've unfortunately um, jumped off the cliff and tried to build the wings on the way down. And especially with the Pikes Peak project with the Huna Pig, um, that was that was a huge ask from a lot of individuals to make something work that ultimately ended up failing miserably. Uh, from the media standpoint, this seems okay. We're competitors, though, right? Um, it was a hard pill to swallow to tell the, everybody that we have to pack it up. Uh, I'm not okay with that. And, and that, the bounce back from that and the, uh, the amount that I've obsessed over every little aspect of everything we did, of every move we made, every bolt we touched, how much I obsessed over that in the last six weeks has, uh, it's been pretty tremendous, almost consuming. How do you Un- unhealthy? I've had to like back off from that a little bit. Okay. That's, that's, um, that's really interesting though. How do you know when to call time on that obsession? Because it, a certain amount of it is deeply useful and then. There's a water line where you go above it, and it is like it is counterproductive times a thousand. Right? Yeah, I'll um, yeah, I'll hold on to the the whale all the way down. Uh, <laughs> it's peop- it's people around you um that that see that. Yeah, uh, my yeah. wife, for example, um, she knows when I'm when I'm going down, <laughs> and she knows when I'm when I'm when I'm like. Uh, she almost says you burn everything down around you to find the solution, <laughs> and that's a it's an unhealth. It's an uh, to me from a balance standpoint, it's wildly unhealthy. Um. It's it's something that I've I know it sounds weird like I'm at therapy right now but it's something that I've I'm trying to work on that I can incrementally make the moves I need to make without going like this down into the focus hole yeah. and just letting everything else around me go, fall apart. Um, but that's a, that's a hard so, balance, right? Because on the one hand, that quality yeah. is what makes you who you are and where you got and what you have done. And on the other hand, it is easily the one thing that could undo so much of it, right? Do you? I think. I think the the yin and yang of that is 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 a a relationship between those two virtues that um, they're required. You have to have the ability to, and, and maybe I don't know how do I put this. You have to have one. You can't have just one of those and without the other. Uh, you can't have that virtue of oh I can solve every single problem. Blah 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 blah. I'm not saying I do, but without the 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 imbalance that it causes within your life or within the construct of what you're doing. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a handshake. I think it's a, the heart and the mind meeting. Um, and I think, you know, that's a journey I'm on right now is trying to figure out how do I can, how can I be more effective with what I do, but still maintain balance in life? I have a six year old son. I have 14 people that work here at BBI that I have close relationships with who also have kids who, you know, I have myself that I have to keep up. I have to work out. I have to eat. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, there, you have your social life. I have my mom, my dad, my families and in-laws and the, everything that just goes when, when, you know, when I'm obsessed on a project. Um, it was easier when I was younger because I didn't care. I didn't care if I lived in my car. I'd go to the state park, take a shower and haul ass to work and get it done. I'd work till midnight. I don't care. I didn't care. Now I have a life. Now I have responsibilities. We have a business. We have... You know, those are the things that, that, um, you remember what I said earlier, every, when everything's fine, you know, it's like when things aren't fine, um, which I've found myself in that position a lot. Uh, I've learned a lot about how to behave, but I've also failed not just in like tinkering a car, or dropping a valve at Pikes Peak. I failed at, um, you know, balancing my home life. I failed at balancing my business because I go, I don't care if the business goes out of business back when I was younger, I want to get this done and I want to get, I want to, I want to see the result. I want to see this through. Now I can't do that because then if I, if I selfishly do that, I'm jeopardizing 14 people's lives, you know? And then, 
Yeah, it's just it's it's one of those things that um, that it's a kind of almost a new journey for me. It's it's awesome. I'm loving it. It's just I, it's a unhealthy um, what would you call it? Unhealthy relationship with 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 uh, you know with your passion. But that's that's I mean that's that's the old line, right? It is very very easy to be. It's very easy to be focused and happy and content when everything is going right. It's very easy to get the balance right when you have two things you're trying to balance, right? Batim needs to sleep and eat, and Batim needs to make the shop run, right? When you have it, yeah. a, literally 10 or 14 or 20 other things going on. That, and that's, that's, we talk about that a lot here, you know, the idea that it's, that balance is what makes you you and me me, and everybody tunes it differently. But ultimately, like, the, it's, it's knowing how many pieces to include and knowing it, you know, where to set the faders on the board and how they come out. So one of, right. one of the things that um, I find really interesting about racing drivers who are, you know, generally not as a, as a breed interesting people, but you ask them the right questions, and it's like, you know, you get, sometimes you get the right answer out of the machine. But between drivers mm -hmm. and engineers and people who build cars is the reaction to testing, right? Because some people see it as just endless, endless hammering around, doing endless laps, just banging out laps, banging out data, looking at stuff. It's boring as hell. And some people see it as deeply soothing and some people see it as you know somewhere in between but you're looking for problems to solve and and one way or the other it is necessary right because whether it's calming <laughs> calming calming answers and questions you don't know or don't know how to define or simply just shaking down a process or people or group of people it you know it's all important and it, it's part of the process and it's part of like can we go back to donahue right like it's it's part of what modern motorsport is 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 focused on is figuring out running the, running the simulation so many times that you know where the holes are in it. Do you like that process? Does it drive you nuts? How do you look at it? No, I love it. I love the um I love the testing process. I love the feeling of exploring. It's almost like you're in a dark room, you're building this car or you're doing something and you're in a dark room and all you can see is this focused little light and that's each little step in front of you and then you go testing and all of a sudden the lights come on in the room and you just, and it's a it's it almost sets the cadence of how you're going to proceed to the results you're after um do we have big problems cool big problems are easy to solve a lot of little problems man because they affect each other so much you know if, okay hey we missed it on turbo sizing great easy okay we can band-aid it for now let's work on the rest of the car you know um it does it just I, I love that side of the 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 the, the process is, is the testing and turning the lights on in the room. It really does in my eyes sets the cadence. Um and I think that's why I like to drive the cars also because when when it, it just fast tracks my relationship with the driver. When they say, Hey, it's doing this and this and this when I'm in here, I'm like, Okay, cool, you're left footing you're left foot braking a little deep. Look at the data. If you if you if you pull off that brake just a little bit earlier, let the car rotate, it unlocks the diff, and then you can go to throttle early. You know, just those things help me identify that. And just I, I'm always about trying to diminish the amount of time in between um, issue and result and, you know, issue and, and resolution um, and, and, and just trying to process it as fast as I can, taking as much information as possible. Uh, and everybody here is like that as well, uh, which is great. We look at everything, the whole team, everybody we work with, um, all of our partners, that we just surround ourselves with people with that like-mindedness of, of uh, no ego and just boom, 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 you know, and, and it's that I, it's one of my favorite parts about all this. It's almost like once you get to the race, especially at Pike's Peak, you're like, it's a green light. You're like, oh, my job's done. <laughs> it's up to, up to, up to the mountain and the driver now. Um, does the, but, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, does the ratio of big problem, you mentioned big problems and small problems, right? But in the fact that as, as counterintuitive as it sounds, big problems are usually easier to fix for some reason. Does that ratio, the ratio... Yeah, big... What's that? Sorry, go ahead and finish that. Does that ratio, the, the percentage of big to small problems that you see, does that change as you do this longer and longer and start to see, you know, you can kind of sort of guess where things are going to end up, or is it always just a crapshoot? No, it's not. That, it's... You, you have to approach your next project as, as you just said, I hated my work last time. What do I, what am I, how am I going to fix this? How am I going to fix what I didn't like? And typically, maybe writing is wildly different, but at the end of the day, what I don't like is a bad result or a slow car, right? Yeah. And w Or if we have to get to here, what, what's in the way? Um, so then you approach the next bigger project and you go both feet in now, like, oh, we just modified a cup car last year. 
why don't we just build something from scratch, right? <laughs> and learn everything we, you know, so now version two of next time is everything we learned on this project. Hopefully those big problems that we had to, you know, work out. Now they become those weird, like, you know, what, when I said earlier about the difference between like Lamar and Pikes Peak is Pikes Peak is big, low hanging fruit and making big moves. Lamar is these tiny little steps within this this confined box that you have to operate in with you know the the ACO sets the you know the BOP all of that stuff so you're really I mean there's a lot a lot of energy for little tiny movements that you know that's I think that's a lot of big brain people go there right and that's because <laughs> um, it, it takes that finite focus and you have that huge budget because you have to have so many people focused on so many little things where you have two tire guys and you have six people in the traction control development because one guy is talking about how much uh, steering wheel input you have uh, versus how much you know lateral acceleration and that's <laughs> doing a desired slip line and all that fun stuff. I mean, I love all that, but like honestly, I, I like you know big, 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 big swings. Yeah. Um, Which makes sense when you. It, ho- hope, sorry. Yeah, I was gonna say that makes sense. Yeah, I was gonna say, but hopefully, as we develop further develop the car further uh those pro- big problems become these small little things and now we're starting to look at those little tiny uh little tiny issues that could you know 10 of those things yield big results and that's where you find speed is is really in that in that the, i call it the granular in the sand is that's where you know the big rocks and then you heard that analogy where you have in a jar you have these big rocks and then you have smaller rocks to fill in those spots and then you think you're full with the big rocks and you're like oh wait we we filled it up. Now we can fit smaller rocks in. Then all of a sudden you're like, okay, there's no way. We're... Then you put the sand in there, you're right? And then you fill it with water. So as you get down the road, hopefully you're starting to get closer to that. We're filling it with water. And that's that's where you're going to really actually find the results. Is, um, But unfortunately, you have such a short amount of time to do things that you have to make do with what you have the best you can. And, um, yeah, a lot of times there's a lot of brain damage along the way with that. <laughs> Would it, you know, given that short amount of time, would it be more interesting or less interesting for you if, like, you could attack, you know, Pikes Peak or Lamar or whatever it is with an infinite amount of preparation and testing? Or does that just take all the the interest out of it? What is that theory called? (laughs) There's a – is it Parkinson's law that states that if I give my guys 30 minutes to knock the wheels off of that – Seven, I'm looking at a 71911 down there and mountain balance new tires on it and get the thing road tested. They're going to take 29 and a half of yeah. those minutes to do the, the it. Job if I give them two to hours, they're going to take an hour. Yeah, yeah they're going to fit. And I'm the same way. I'm a victim of that. If you tell me that I got two years to build a car, I'm going to take two years in a day. And I don't, I don't know why. So it's like the old rule uh, about the disciplines how... of time frames. Oh, sorry. Yeah. The, you know, I was going to say the green flag at the end of the day is what dictates you know, the start of the race is what dictates your time frame. Um, <laughs> and I think that's why a lot of shops struggle with long-term projects, myself included. You know, if I have a customer who says, well, I'm not in too much of a hurry. I don't have much going on. <laughs> you know, that's going to – five years later. Yeah. It's like the – You know what I mean? Yeah. You, it's like the yeah. rule about how you never – you know, when you drop a car for restoration or a race car or whatever, you never tell the guys building it, no, take your time, and uh, it doesn't matter. Nope. You just never do. Cause I have it, to be at Luft Cool. On October eighteenth, yeah, we need to get this damn thing done. Nothing, and then then guess what? You're going to get it done. <laughs> so, that's 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 also a discipline that I wish we could work past. But that's one of those things that we're, um, you know, the humans, right? And so, I to, to answer your question, no, I, I I don't want a lot of time. I want adequate time and budget because the budget budget will help me put the right people in place and. If everybody works eight hours a day, we work 16. You know, if everybody works 16, we're going to work 20. Um, and we're going to cram in a lot more in a short amount of time. Um, and everybody we surround ourselves with does the same thing. So it's, it's, I think it's special. Um, and I think it's, it's amazing. It, it, it just it, – it beats people up, but it also builds people up. Because every time we walk away from something like that – and I'm not kidding you. I mean, there, I, when we were at Pikes Peak and we had the issue with the engine um, – I didn't go to my Airbnb from like Sunday till Wednesday. We like were at three the shop days? and I was shuttling people back. Yeah, I was shuttling people back and forth so they can get some sleep. And they'd come back, and then I'd bring the electronics crew in at six in the morning. And then I'd, I was like, okay, at six a.m., I'm gonna go back to the house and sleep. Well, then they find something interesting, so I'm there with them. <laughs> and it just got into this thing where I took a nap under the car for like an hour once, and then um, you get, you just get into it. And it, but 
if I had the all the time, I just think that that I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I maybe I'm just not disciplined enough to utilize that time wisely. I will take my liberties with it, you know. And I don't. You know, it's a great question. I, I will think about that. I think I think that's in as much as there is, you know, ever a right answer or wrong answer to these things, which there isn't. Um, you know, I think that's probably closer to the right answer than not. I mean, simply for the idea that you know most people would rather build something within a box, you know, creating something within a box is, is infinitely easier and, and, and you can wrap your head around it than saying you have a blank sheet of paper, do whatever the hell you want. And all of a sudden you look out at the horizon and the horizon goes on forever and you know, your, your brain collapses in on itself and becomes a waveform or whatever. Um, sp so speaking of that stuff, right? So, so let's, let's go back to the, I, I keep saying it wrong. I'm just going to call it the pig. Let's go back to the, the, the 911, right? The Ken's car. So this is a 1400 horsepower, four liter, turbocharged, all wheel drive thing that has some things in common with the 964, but saying it was once a 964 is like deeply understating what you guys built. Uh, it's mid engined, you know, the motor's ahead of the rear axle, and the suspension, uh, <laughs> the suspension adjusts in real time based on a GPS trace of the mountain and what you've told it to do. Uh, 2200 pounds, you know, it, it basically looks like a 911 that somebody left out. In the sun, chopped the bottom half off of, and then left out in the sun, and it melted a little, and then it grew a tumor of a rear wing, and things went from there. You, you said you drove it. I'm too much of a dork to not ask. What was it like? Insane. Um, Why? When we started, we, so, you know, I only compare it to 911s right. because that's that's what I drive uh, at the track, and what I've been lucky enough and fortunate enough to be able to wrap my career around. Um, it was like nothing I've ever driven. Uh, it was. It was what struck me the most is when we turned the power up and started dialing the suspension in. It blew my mind that it that was as easy as it was to drive. Um, I felt comfortable in the car immediately, um, and that was weird. And I just wanted more. Um, you know, there's an obvious learning curve to driving an aero car with active suspension and a mid engine and all wheel drive. I've never driven a mid engine all wheel drive really anything on the track with any sort of at any sort of violent level. Um it, it was it, it was just an attack on all the senses, the sounds it makes. I mean, I got to I got to get some in-car <laughs> up on the internet at some point because it sounds like an RSR with boost. Like you let <laughs> off the you hear the you hear all the noises, the gearbox you have a drive shaft next to your shoulder spinning at 7,500 RPMs. When you click into sixth gear, um, it just, you just hear things. And it's, it's just – and being a mechanic, I, I, I'm, like, freaking out about everything I hear. I'm like, But well, you just trust it and go. Uh, but it was, it's a really, really cool car. Uh, what I'm excited about is testing it more. Uh, we're getting it running here. Uh, we're rebuilding the engine currently. Um, and we're going to go the end of September, you know, three or four-day test at a track and just beat the death out of this thing and then uh, turn it over to Ken Block. Um, and so he can start doing what he wants to do with it. Um, we've got to get her back out there and then start practicing for pikes next year. So, so 1400 horsepower in, in most people's minds sounds like an awful lot. Um, you know, you've built one of the things your business is known for, um, is four figure 911s, right? Thousand fifteen hundred horsepower 911s. Um, it's a pretty famous right. 996 turbo. It was named King Kong that came out of what you guys do. But the, the, the idea of getting up there is, it, it 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 hits into one of the things about tuner cars that I've always found really amusing is that most people who build these things don't spend time making them last. They spend time making them make the number, and then you have the number, and boom, it's there. And there's some stuff that is inherently more durable, and there's some stuff that is inherently not based on what you're working with. But what does it what does it take to make you know a, a, like the nine and six for example? What does it take to make those motors? be durable at that output and more important what was the process like figuring that out was it interesting was it frustrating was it just keep going until you blow this up and then tackle that or what it, yeah uh, good question so the 996 when we were doing that medsker engine um it i think it was one of the first gt3 turbo packages we've done um and we we just kept breaking things <laughs> and you push it to 800 wheel and you're like oh cool we bent the shit out of the rods <laughs> all right better rods let's, let's uh take a little weight out of the crankshaft let's make sure everything's right. balanced right okay um we got a good piston good rod in there holy crap we bent the wrist pins okay bigger wrist pin cool we lifted the heads okay well <laughs> there you had a thousand horsepower all right uh, let's put a better head stud in there oh those head studs didn't work because it distorted the block and blew our head gasket so we need a different head stud that that moves with the heat so then we go to 
a stud manufacturer, and we actually destroyed like six different types of head studs <laughs> until we found something that grew with the engine with different heats and everything. And then, and then we're like, holy crap, we need a new head gasket. We need this, blah, 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 different cam profile, and then valve train. And then you just go all the way out. You're like, oh, okay, now we need a bigger turbo. And then, oh, oh shit, we're at 1,600 horsepower, and the thing's living for like six seasons now. <laughs> so it, you just break things. Yeah. I mean, because there's no book. You right. know, there's, I mean, and when we were doing this, it's, it's, it's like I said, it's brute force and ignorance. There isn't like, well, scientifically, you could do a load calculation and you could see what the – every time I asked anybody to give me the load calcs and cylinder pressures <laughs> and, and what the piston velocities are over those cylinder pressures, be like, oh, that's not going to last. <laughs> well, it, it did. The person making our pistons didn't believe how much power we were. Really? And, yep. And they're just like, that's impossible. There's no way. <laughs> I was like, well, we – we took this 997 GT3 engine and we made 1,900 horsepower out oh of it, God. and that car's been sold three times, and the engine's still in one piece. <laughs> um, so, I, I, like I said, I, I don't know because there is no book, you know. But now enough people are doing it, right? right? And and there's enough. So, going to the Hunapig car, the Pig, we tr- we started with a different engine. We started with the new MA family engine, right? And that's the the latest and greatest. Um, Actually, not the latest and greatest. Second, it's a version right before this now 992 version. And I, I thought that that might be the future of, you know, big horsepower, whether it's NA or yeah. why not? You know, I know the Metzger. I love the Metzger. I know it like the back of my hand. But I want to evolve as a company. Um, and that power plant is in its infancy from a development standpoint. And, well, we found its weaknesses. <laughs> and now here we are, right? We're right back to 2009 with the Metzger. Right. And so now we're going to put better valve train in it, different ECU uh, rev cut strat. We're going to do a lot of different things to it, and we're going to break something else. And then we're going to do that again, and then, you know, and then we're going to break something else. And then now with Autodesk and Fusion 360 and a lot of their um, generative de- design components that we actually have access to, that's actually starting to help us monitor and, and model uh, valve train in real time. Mm-hmm. Uh, with a, just a couple of light sensors, we can model all this stuff. So we're slowly getting there. Um, that's a big thing, uh, what we're doing with Autodesk right now. And that, I can expand more on that after September. But um, uh, now we're starting to utilize some of the tools that the big guys use. And, and with our experiences, we can stack that, those experience into this model and extrapolate and pull some pretty, pretty wild things. And... Uh, we touched on that a little bit with this Hunapig build. Um, Dimitri, my right-hand man here and, and lead engineer, he you, you got with um, the Autodesk crew and did generative airflow models based on what this engine could output. And that's what actually designed our exhaust manifold. Cool. was essentially a computer oh, cool. model. I'm not going to say AI because it wasn't AI, but you know, with enough data, yeah. it put out this weird shape and this weird flow path that seems to work really really damn well <laughs> so we're going to continue on that path oh, cool more to come well more to come on that note we're we're about out of time but one of the things we do do here is kind of end this thing with with a question and it's some version of the same question every time um and it, it's been amusing so far the stuff that's come out of it but basically what's the first thing that goes through your head when things go wrong man great question uh what ha- <laughs> it can also just be a single it's, word, maybe four letters if you want. Maybe just no, loud noises. No, it's, it's not. It's a, it's an explosion. You know what? A, you remember those old Rolodex yeah. that you'd flip and all the names and the, that's what happens in my head of <laughs> cause of issue, potential fix, and do we have enough resources to do that in a short amount of time? That is exactly what goes through my head every single time something goes wrong. <laughs> um, and then it's potential catastrophe outside of if we – this – what – that broke, did it take anything else out that if we fix this, is something else weakened, which always happens. Um, but that is exactly what happens every single time. Like 2021, we had an aerodynamic issue with, with the two cars that the um, – we'd get into a porpoise in the front of the car and – it would confetti the front splitter <laughs> and just no matter how – so we had to do some design changes in a short amount of time. And I remember that was outside of my wheelhouse. I didn't know what the hell was going on. And so, you know, we, we had to address that. But there's always problems. There's always failure. It's just – that's – to answer your question, yeah, the, 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 the fireworks start and it's like in a three-part deal. It's what – identify the issue, how do we fix it, and do we have enough resources to do so in a short amount of time? 
And then the fourth, if we do, if we answer yes to all of that stuff, like you solve, 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 then the fourth is like, what else did it take out that is going to potentially ruin our <laughs> drive to where we need to go? So that's my thought process. I, I love that. That's, that's process driven. You are definitely an engineer, and that's pretty great. Well, <laughs> but Tim, thanks for taking the time for this. Uh, we really appreciate it. It's been great, and uh, good luck going forward, awesome. man. Thank you. This is my fa- favorite podcast I've been on. Yes. I appreciate it. Yes, we love to hear it. Thanks, man. I'll talk to you in a bit. Awesome. All right. See you guys. <laughs>